Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Paul Thiessen, Ali Sanjabi, and Andrew Bradley. Coming up on DTNS, PlayStation launches its streaming competitor to Xbox Game Pass. Flag emojis no longer allowed. And whether Europe's DMA will break end-to-end -end encryption. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, March 29th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm John Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Toronto, I'm Jen Cutter. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We are happy to bring you some good tech news today. So let's start with a few tech things you should know. After an announcement back in January, NVIDIA launched the GeForce RTX 3090 Ti today for $2,000 with a limited Founders Edition board exclusive to Best Buy Online. The triple card slot looks similar to the RTX 3090, has 24 gigs of GDDR6X running at 21 gigabytes per second, 40 teraflops of G GPU performance, a base clock of 1560 megahertz, 10,752 CUDA cores, 78 RT teraflops, and, uh, and 320 sensor T-flops as well. NVIDIA claims it will be 9% faster than the RTX 3090. But, hey, at least Asus announced a price drop of up to 25% for NVIDIA 30 series GPUs starting on April 1st. We are suspicious. <laughs> Apparently it's supposed to keep going after that, but will it? Uh, Microsoft is adding an easy way to change your default browser in Windows 11. Uh, if you remember, Windows 11 shipped without uh, a simple way to switch your default browser, something that was always available in Windows 10. In the latest update, Windows 11 users can now go to the default apps section and just choose their browser of choice. No, like digging in, finding settings. Uh, Microsoft also says it plans to announce bigger changes to Windows 11 for hybrid work at an event on April 5th. Otter.ai is well known for its ability to transcribe text from audio files. The company is adding some new features, including automatically transcribing meetings. Otter will provide a calendar and user accounts, letting users jump into meetings using Otter integrations with Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and also Google Meet. A meeting summary uses AI using a combination of singles like what words have been used, who's talking, etc., highlighting the most important moments. Meeting gems take segments highlighted by participants, which can then be tagged or commanded uh, from, from uh, folks using it. Users can also add screenshots to transcripts, and it also offers some analytics, like who spends the most time talking in meetings. Oh, yeah, that's never going to be misused, I'm sure. It'll be fine. Uh, hey, the Google Hangouts mobile app. Uh, we continue to document the long decline. It has now been removed from both the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store as Google continues to move everybody on Google Workplace over to Google Chat. Uh, the old version of the app still works if you if you still have it installed, but uh, it will have a big pop-up now that tries to encourage you to switch over to Google Chat and no word on how long that old app will continue to work. Well, speaking of old apps, remember the Amazon Glow? It was a video calling device that was part projector and kind of meant for children so they could play games over a call. If you don't remember it, uh, it's fine. It, that was announced in September and sold by invite only, but now it's available to all US customers. Might actually be something that you would be interested in. The price has risen from $249 to $299, and it includes a one-year subscription to Amazon Kids Plus, might be, might be uh, worth your while if you're in that market. The consensus in our Twitch chat is no. They no, <laughs> don't remember that. I know. That. I, I was I was being kind. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk a little more about this big old Sony announcement. Jen, what do we got? We have a lot of news. All right. So Sony revealed their game subscription plan, formerly codenamed Spartacus. The new system is taking on the name PlayStation Plus, but has three tiers instead of one. And PlayStation Now will be rolled into one of the tiers. The lowest tier, PlayStation Plus Essential, is the same price as the existing PS Plus offering at $9.99 a month or $59.99 a year. It includes the same features like online multiplayer, cloud storage for saved games, two downloadable games a month, and if you're already subscribed to PlayStation Plus, this is the tier you'll automatically be converted to, mm. don't have to do a thing. Middle tier is called PlayStation Plus Extra. It adds a downloadable catalog of up to 400 PS4 and PS5 games, 
for $14.99 a month or $99.99 a year. Note that Sony will not be making its first-party titles available on PlayStation Plus on the day of release. And the top tier is called PlayStation Plus Premium. On top of everything else, you can download and stream PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, and PSP games, and PlayStation 3 games can be streamed. If you're in a market that has PlayStation Now, you can stream those plus PS4 games as well, and this is the only tier with access to time-limited game trials. PlayStation Plus Premium costs $17.99 a month or $119.99 a year. This is the tier that PlayStation Now customers will be automatically converted to. As for the streaming, Sony doesn't offer streaming in all its markets, so there's a special tier called PlayStation Deluxe that will be cheaper than premium in those markets, though the exact prices are not announced yet. It'll include downloadable games from OG PlayStation, PS2, and PSP, plus the limited game trials. All of this begins in June in Asia, followed by Europe and North America, and as a final note, for PS3 and Vita users, because they haven't totally forgotten you yet, you won't be able to renew subscriptions on those consoles, and will have to do it on desktop and mobile instead. And Sony reiterates, if you remain subscribed, any PS3 and PS Vita benefits, such as previously redeemed monthly games, will continue to be accessible. So at least they're not completely cut off, even if they're kind of end of life. We will not actively annoy a small but vocal minority <laughs> of our customer base. Uh, smart move, Sony. Uh, what do you think of this, Jen? I mean, it, it it feels like this is not nearly as complete or compelling as Xbox Game Pass. But if you're already in the Sony ecosystem, it certainly is is a, a, a decent way to convert. You're, if you're on a, an existing subscription plan, you get the same or better with options for more. I'm really glad they made it seamless for existing subscribers because you don't want to anger people who are already giving you money and who have already probably committed to a year or two because a lot of people like me locked in before they raised the price. So I have like another year or so left. So I don't have to do anything, which is great. But because these tiers match up pretty much one for one with all the rumors, now that it's finally here, it feels slightly underwhelming. And like the part that I find kind of annoying is selling game limited trials. That's not a feature I would ever pay for. <laughs> it doesn't matter the system, doesn't matter the console, I'm not paying for a demo. And then because I am a longtime gamer, I may already even own like 250 of the games that they're offering, <laughs> if not more, because I have Which all my, I, my OG collection that, that was, I never traded in. That was a complaint I heard from other people saying, this is great, but what if you already have a lot of these games? Is, yeah. that, is this going to be worth your while? Yeah, is the convenience enough and the omission of day one PlayStation games like the Microsoft Game Pass has? Microsoft Game Pass has been very aggressively saying, hey, play everything day one. You don't even have to pre-order. It'll just be there. That's a huge plus. And they have the EA tie-in. Whereas as of right now, Sony has not announced any catalogs outside of their own first to third parties. And, yeah. So uh, yeah, like maybe some ben some Bungie stuff will be kind of added in the future, but it's nebulous. There's no game list out. So there's no way to go like, yes, I got to get in on that. It's just... Yeah, I guess I'll wait and see what's good. Yeah, I feel like things like the the, the limited trials are, are just a throw in to be like, let's add another line to the slide so that you feel like you're getting more. It's certainly not the the marquee feature. Uh, and if I had to describe this, I would say that the new PlayStation Plus tiers are nice to haves, not have to haves. Whereas Xbox Game Pass feels closer to have to have. Yeah, and Xbox also being available on PC kind of also is a mark in its favor because not everybody can get a console. Like if you yeah. only have a PS3 right now, there's no point in switching anything. You can do some PC streaming on this though, right? You can, uh, and but you still, I believe, need a PS4 for the majority of the games. Now, PS4s are still available, so that's a plus. Uh, but if you're like waiting for a PS5, save your money and get a PS5, then look at the tiers. Yeah. Well, uh, we all love a good emoji story. <laughs> we have a couple for you today. Uh, first off, YouTube is running a limited test letting users share certain emoji reactions at a particular moment 
in some videos. So if Jen makes a video, I'm watching the video five minutes, 50 seconds in, I might say, ah, ha ha, fun, fun. I want her to know that I thought that that was funny, uh, which is like leaving a comment, but it's an emoji comment. So similar to the beta test of time comments where users could opt to leave and view comments at specific moments, talking about specific time in a, in a, uh, in a video. A separate reaction panel in the comment section of those enabled videos will display the emoji reactions at those specific moments, but won't list the user names of who's reacting. So if you're a content creator, uh, you kind of get a just a, a, a like a finger on the pulse of what might be resonating with your audience, but not necessarily who's commenting precisely and when and why. But in other emoji news, the Unicode Consortium is cutting off new flag emoji sub, uh, submissions. And you might say, well, why would they do that? Turns out Unicode can't remove a character once it's been added. Only designs can be changed, like if a country changes its flag type thing. If an emoji already exists, uh, the consortium has the opportunity to, 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 to doctor it up a little bit, uh, depending on what's going on in the world. But flags are the least used of all emoji, even though they're the largest group, if you're kind of scrolling through looking for emojis to use. The consortium wants to limit the number of emoji added each year. You know, it's time consuming, etc. If flags aren't that popular, then adding more flags doesn't make a lot of sense. So keep in mind, this affects regional flags, organizational flags, stuff like that. Flags are still automatically recommended for countries with a Unicode region code, that's recognized by the United Nations, but that will only happen when a new country is recognized by the UN. And that doesn't happen very often. So yeah. So if, if you're worried, like, what if a new country, you know, uh, splits off uh, from Sudan or, or or something? Do they do they not get their flag in here? No, they get their. The, those are the only flags that will be added in the future, right. according to this. What what Unicode is saying is, look. We just define the flag. We'll say that flag is for Canada. If Canada changes its flag to, to something, you know, we'll, you can change it in, in your implementation of it, but we're not going to add flags for stuff anymore. Uh, we'll look at adding hearts, you know, because people are like, what about pride flags? If there's new pride flags, they acknowledge that there will be other ways that they'll work with that. But they were saying, look, folks, yeah one or two flags get used a lot and certainly at world cup time or olympics time they might get used a, a little more but the vast majority of these flags never get used and everybody wants us to add a flag for their region let's say they use the example of catalan in spain they're like well if we add catalan do we have to add all the regions in spain and if we add all the regions in spain do we have to add all the prefectures in japan and then do we have to add you know all the states in australia uh, maybe they already have the states in australia i don't know but you know they they're like there has to be a line and we're drawing the line at actual un recognized countries yeah, uh, you know, I, I love a, uh, sorry to cut you off, Jen. I love a good uh, emoji story. And I I just wasn't aware. I was not aware that, I mean, I know that the uh, Unicode Consortium doesn't want to just add every emoji that anybody ever thinks of uh, year after year. Uh, there's, you know, there's there, there are certain ones that make sense. And, and, and that's why there's a consortium to make these decisions. I just didn't realize that flags were not all that used. I feel like I see them quite a bit and you know it might have something to do with ukraine and and just what's going on in the world uh fairly recently but uh but yeah it's uh i guess you know flags are not the most popular i believe i've used them twice and both times were in a bio <laughs> the rest i like i congratulated the canadian men's national soccer team and also didn't use a flag i think i used the hashtag instead how many flags have you either of you seen have any of us seen that were not a top level UN recognized country flag? I can't think of one. Pride to be flag. Honest. That's the only one I could think of. Uh, yeah, no. I mean, even I, I, you know, I'm a proud American, but I've never used the American flag in any bio that I've had. I I've seen the I US flag used, but again, that's a absolutely. top Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. especially like you're saying, Jen, you know, sports related stuff. Totally get that. You do see that. And maybe because the Olympics were recently, I feel like oh, I see flags all the time. But yes, not necessarily the uh, the more specific flags. Here's where it's going to cause a problem is the next time there's a weird Olympics thing <laughs> where there's 
like a sub region of a country allowed to compete, but not the country itself, right? Mm -hmm. Great Britain mm -hmm. is an example. They use the UK flag for that, so it's fine. But World Cup, England plays, Scotland played. Those are regions of the United Kingdom. I don't know. It's probably gonna it's gonna happen in some kind of international sports competition. I think. It's kind of yeah. It's kind of hard to believe that would that would be an issue. But you know, that's that's the news as we report. All right. Several customers of Verizon Wireless and its MVNO Visible have reported getting spam texts that appear to come from themselves, from their own phone number. This makes the spam impossible to report or block because the phone's like, no, it's from you. You can't, you can't report that. The cause is not anything sophisticated. Uh, if you don't know, just like with email, you can set the from in a text message to anything you want if you know how. Uh, that's useful. You might be like, why do they allow that? That It's useful for companies with large marketing operations or companies with large customer support operations who want a single number that all the messages come from, but they may use multiple accounts to generate them. It also means, however, that uh, you can get these spoofed accounts. It does not mean your phone account was breached in any way. It's just a spoof. The carriers and the phone makers have spam protection that usually tries to detect and block these kinds of unwanted messaging. So spoofing the phone number of the phone you're sending to is kind of ingenious because I bet a lot of those filters exempt the originating phone number. Verizon, however, says it's working to block the messages and it's working with US law enforcement to stop the source. Uh, if you wanna know what you can do about it, US users can forward the spam messages to 7726. That spells out spam. Uh, though a login, uh, logging that with a message that appears to come from you does seem rife with possibilities for confusion and error. Uh, the US FCC has a more formal complaint process, which includes a category called my own number is being spoofed. Canadians can use a form at fightspam.gc.ca, and then there you can choose the sender's contact information provided in the message was incorrect, not valid, or misleading. Uh, but hopefully Verizon will just uh, figure this out. Jen, you said your dad ran into this. Yeah, I was actually happy to see this story because now I can send it to my dad and be like, see, like you did nothing wrong because he was... Because he's roaming, I guess he jumped on the Verizon network and he started getting all these weird messages. And I'm like, I'm sorry, Dad, I, I don't know how to help you here. But now I can at least tell him where to report stuff, even though he probably won't because it's a kind of a long process. <laughs> well, yeah. So if you get if you've gotten one of these, don't freak out. Uh, hopefully Verizon will 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 shut them down and, and they'll go away. Uh, but we have in the show notes a, a couple of ways you could take action if you feel like you'd like to do a little more. Uh, you could also ask if people in the Discord, if you're like, wait, what did Tom say about that? Uh, go join our Discord, start that conversation. You can link your Patreon account to join up at patreon.com slash DTNS. Lots of folks are debating whether Europe's DMA, the Digital Markets Act, is going to break message encryption. Here's why they're saying that. The DMA is still awaiting its first reading in Parliament. So we haven't seen the actual text yet. All we have to go on is public statements, some leaks, and previous drafts from last year. So there's a lot of room for interpretation of what you think might happen. Here's what we actually know. The rule would apply to so-called gatekeepers, a company with market cap of 75 billion euros or turnover in the European economic area equal to or above 7.5 billion euros and at least 45 million monthly end users in the EU and more than 10,000 annual business users. So the biggest companies, companies that meet that size requirement and engage in messaging, WhatsApp and iMessage would meet this qualification, would be required to enable interoperability on request. Keep that in mind. Interoperability would mean exchanging text, video calls and files over an end-to-end -end encrypted service. Non-gatekeeping companies and Telegram and Signal uh, would not qualify as gatekeepers, may then ask a gatekeeper to open up their API. Give us the API so that we can interoperate. So the burden is actually on the smaller companies to write the software to interact with the API. The gatekeepers just have to make the API open. Now the rule will apparently require one-on-one -on -one communication to be implemented three months after a request to interoperate. Audio and video calls and group communication, which are more difficult to encrypt, would have four years to come into compliance. And the European Parliament's rapporteur, Andreas Schwab, told TechCrunch, if telecoms regulators say it's not possible to deliver end-to-end -end encrypted group chats within the next nine months, then it will come as soon as it is possible. So it does seem that 
the EU is not wanting to give on end to end encryption. And that sort of shoots down a lot of the fears that DMA would weaken it. However, we haven't seen the final text. So it's fair to have concern that somehow the final text might be weaker. However, for now, let's assume that the EU, that the EU means it when it says nothing in the DMA is meant to weaken end to end encryption. All right, that's nice, but how do you do that? Benedict Evans uh, posted a bit of what he says is the final draft that would require providers to provide interconnections to their messaging systems under objectively the same conditions and quality that are available or used by the gatekeeper, its subsidiaries, or its partners, thus allowing for a functional interaction with these services. So it has to be functional and it has to be about the same quality. They can't degrade the service. The Verge quotes Columbia University computer scientist Stephen Bellavin saying, trying to reconcile two different cryptographic architectures simply can't be done. One side or the other will have to make major changes. It's just the nature of encryption. The way you implement it, if it's not all part of the same system, you have to do a conversion or you have to change to use the other person's system. One likely scenario might be that big companies create a special API that works with their encryption scheme, thus meeting the functionality argument, but leaves implementing the encryption scheme to the smaller app maker. Uh, it, it's hard to tell if that would qualify, but that might be one way they do it. However, that can only technically be done by converting the encrypted payloads since no two systems have the same schemes. And that means technically the message would have to be converted to plain text on something called a bridge and then re-encrypted. So it wouldn't technically be end-to-end -end encrypted. Now that could possibly be done on your device, so it's only unencrypted on your end, but it still leaves a weakness and potentially violates the law depending on how it's written by not being end-to-end. -end. Another option would be a universal encryption standard that everybody signs up for. There's lots of these. Uh, there's the open source matrix messaging protocol. They've been doing a lot of work to put themselves forward as an option. XMPP and messaging layer security are other options. This does not appear to be required by the DMA. So if one of these were to be adopted, you'd have to get all the companies voluntarily on board, which that's not an easy task. Maybe the requirements of the DMA would encourage them to do that, but it's not required yet. There are other concerns as well. WhatsApp head Will Cathcart told Casey Newton about a few. Uh, spam, since third parties might not be as vigilant against spam as WhatsApp, that's making it harder to prevent. Uh, WhatsApp is also unsure if its forwarding limits would be legal under the DMA. My guess is that we end up with a green bubble, blue bubble system everywhere. Uh, In-network messages get full features and guarantees of privacy and security. Out-of-network messages technically work, but get treated separately. And how much deviance would be allowed remains to be seen by the text of the law. Uh, the finalized text isn't done yet. We expect it to come probably in the next month or so. And then this wouldn't become law till October at the earliest. Well, well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Left I, uh, you speechless, didn't it? Well, no, I, I, there's actually a lot to think about here. I think, mm -hmm. you know, one of the 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 rule, the rule that uh, governs what is considered a gatekeeper could change over time based on how companies do and, you know, what their market cap is and, and how they're There's no indication business. of that. There's no indication of that. The gatekeeper is the one thing we do know the full text of. So there's no indication that that's going to change. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, but uh, assuming that it doesn't, then yeah, it, I think that there there are certain companies that will have to try to, I don't know, I guess play nice API wise with with other companies in order for this to work. I don't, I don't really see why you know unless unless your uh, your hand is forced uh, governmentally why uh companies would bother jen we, we can't hear you you're muted unfortunately so if you could unmute that one happily uh i agree with sarah because if this happened in canada i think these apps would be like all right bye <laughs> but because it's happening in the eu i think they're going to have to find a way to work around it and like my brain can't like even with your excellent summary i have no idea how the actual text of this is going to be written in a way that makes it feasible within the timelines they're asking for yeah i mean short of requiring a standard which it doesn't seem like they're going to write into the law maybe they will but uh, it, it, there's no indication of that either it seems like they're saying 
make this end-to-end -end encrypted, but also interoperable, and that all the security experts out there are saying, you can't really do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless you agree on a standard, which I don't know, maybe that's the EU's point is, we're gonna make it really hard for you to, to, to uh, follow this law to where your only option is to agree on a standard. So you better go agree on a standard, everybody. The new standard will be called unicorn because everybody wants a unicorn. <laughs> or pony or a pony unicorn. <laughs> mm. Unipony. Uh, new thing. Get on board, everybody. Uh, a little Easter egg in Windows 1.0 RTM. Harken back to the old days, everybody. Has been found by a man named Lucas Brooks. Who said which which says congrats lucas doesn't say that the uh, easter egg itself says congrats also lists the names of the original windows developers behind this code brooks discovered the easter egg inside of a bitmap of a smiley face while deep diving microsoft's first graphical os now if you're thinking well when is this the first one that's ever been found Going back to the early 80s, Atari also didn't include credits in their games. So Atari developer at the time, Warren Robinette, made a credit that was hidden, but also findable. And his boss, Steve Wright, uh, coined the term Easter egg to describe this practice. This is now something we're all pretty familiar with. Piggybacking on the fun, Windows has since gone on to include various Easter eggs with developers' names over the years in various iterations of Windows that can be seen by pressing a sequence of keys. Now, Brooks thinks that the code like that exists for Windows 1.0's credits, but as of now, not been found. Wait, I thought you said it was found. Not, not in in the in the way that it's been found in in other iterations. Hmm. But we found the Windows 1.0 RTM stuff. Correct. Cool. That's this is very cool, and, and it's uh, and it's so retro. If you go look at that Twitter. That tweet. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody out there has found it. Uh, let us know how you feel. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Peter in Brampton, Ontario, who says, love the show. Also, I don't know if I didn't catch it during the discussion on Monday's show about the smart monitor, but is there a remote on the Samsung smart monitor because it would make a home office expense a bit more of a reach back, relaxing experience easier? Yeah, uh, turns out, yes. The answer is yes. Good news. There is a remote. Uh, if you go to, to, to the product page uh, for the Samsung monitor, uh, you, can, you can find the specs. Uh, the remote is different depending on your market, they say. Uh, but yeah, such a weird little product. Uh, Jen, I don't know if you saw this. They talked about it on, on the show yesterday, but it's a, it's a monitor with a computer built into it that runs Tizen. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more it's than a, a smart, smart TV. Yeah. It's a well, it's a smart TV but monitor. Yeah, I, but it's different. kind of like having a smartphone built into the monitor. Yeah, it's weird. And it's, it's also seven hundred bucks. I mean, yes, yeah. you know, it's, it's not an worth... impulse purchase. But in ten years, YouTubers are going to be tearing it apart and being like, "Oh, look at this weird one of a kind thing that was never replicated because it didn't have enough of a use case." It's cheaper than some phones. If you're only ever at your desk. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah, good point. Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> wrapping up the show, thank you so much to you, Jen Cutter, for being with us today. Let folks know where they can keep up with what you've been up to. Well, always on Twitter at Jen Cutter. And this Saturday, because this is a busy week, this Saturday is the next Gaming News Monthly. And if you are an associate producer on the DTNS Patreon, you can check for my column on Thursday about all the excitement going down with Bungie's suit over fraudulent DMCA lawsuits, which is very exciting. I can't wait to talk about it. Become a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks for being with us, Jen. And I seem to have uh, awoken my, uh, my, my smart speaker, <laughs> who is also very excited about this. Also, thanks to a brand new boss that we got. And that boss's name is Tom. Tom just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you. Thank you, new Tom. So glad to have you. Tom with also, an H, too. Yeah. Well, like, I like that. Yeah. A variation. Yeah, 
exactly. If you're not a patron, uh, Good Day Internet starts momentarily. And if you're not part of the fun yet, you can join at patreon.com slash DTNS. Reminder for folks that DTNS now starts 4 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. That is 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back doing it all again tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>